Hello, everyone, and welcome to After School Animal Encounters Weird Eaters Edition. My name is Ryan, and I am the Lead Visitor Services Representative at the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, and I will be your co-host today, along with my friend Javier, who is an educator with the museum, with the Harvard Museum of Natural History, and is standing by with some super amazing animals to show you. At certain points of the presentation, we will be switching between different camera views. So don't worry if the feed changes at times. We are just trying to give you the best view of the animals as possible. All right, now that we have all that boring stuff taken care of, are you all ready to see some super cool animals? Javier, are you and the animals ready? Hey, Ryan. Hey, Javier. How's it going? Not too bad. How are you and the animals doing today? Doing well, doing well. Excited that everybody's here to join us. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here and welcome to our classroom. Uh, we've got a really cool topic today because today we're going to talk about, like Ryan said, weird eaters. So if there's one thing that all animals have in common is that they need food to grow and live, right? Just like you and I, animals eat food to get their energy. And some animals called herbivores get their food from plants. Others get their food from other animals called carnivores. And some animals even eat both, believe it or not. Uh, today, we are gonna be talking about a few animals that eat in unusual ways. Maybe an animal that has a stomach in a place that you didn't expect it, or an animal that may need special help swallowing. Uh, while we won't be feeding all of our animals today, because just like I imagine some of you out there, they can get a little camera shy, we do have some really cool videos to show you of some of them munching on some food. So with that being said, should we get started? Yeah, oh, sounds like it. I'm just excited to go to this first animal. Awesome. So we are gonna start off with an animal that you may think is somewhat a little boring, but believe it or not, is actually quite exciting. So I'm gonna share my screen here and we're going to check out our first animal. All right, can you see that okay, Ryan? Oh yeah, it kind of looks like a shell hanging out at the bottom of a tank there. That is exactly right. So what we're looking at right now is a whelk. A whelk is a type of sea snail. Now, what is so weird and so special about the way a snail eats? Well, believe it or not, snails have all sorts of incredible ways of munching on their food. Um, but one of the things that makes this particular snail special is that it actually is, believe it or not, a carnivore. This snail is a predator. It gets its food from other animals. And that in of itself is pretty strange when you think about it. The snails I'm familiar with that I find in my backyard and my garden typically eat greens, right? They're herbivores, they love plants, they're vegetarians. But this is a snail that actually hunts for its food. And what exactly is it eating, you might ask? And that would be a great question. Well, one of the things our whelks love to eat here at the museum are these guys over here. Everybody see that okay? What we have right now is a live clam. And what you'll notice about this clam is that it is shut tight really, really, really close. You see that? You can't get anywhere inside of it all the way around. So you might ask yourself, how exactly does the whelk eat this clam. And that's what's so, so special and even weird or unusual about our whelk. Turns out that whelks, like almost all marine snails, have a very special type of tool called a radula. A radula is, think of a, a scraping tool, almost like a drill with lots of tiny little teeth. And what they do over time is they get right on top of our clam and they take that radula and they start scraping away at one spot. And they do this repeatedly over and over and over and over again until they start wearing a tiny little hole inside of our clam. A hole it'll look just like this. Let me stop sharing here for a second. Everybody see that? 
Oh, yeah. It's almost like a perfect circle right inside the shell there. So this is a clam shell that has been drilled in through. And what you'll notice is that that's the kind of hole that a whelk would make. And it would stick its proboscis inside this hole. Think of like almost an anteater or a butterfly. But what's really special about this long straw like mouth part is that at the very end, it has that radula, that little scraping tooth bit. And it can actually scrape away and eat the clam from the inside. It never even have to really prying it open. Isn't that incredible? That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I'm a big fan of tidal pools myself in New England where we live. So I'm always in tidal pools playing with the different clams and shells I can find. And one of the things is they're really tough. You'll even see seagulls fly these shells super high up in the air and drop them to try to break into the shell. So it's not a really fragile shell. So it must take quite a bit of effort for that tiny snail to be able to burrow its way through such a hard shell. You're absolutely right. And it can take a long time, but I would imagine for that snail, it's worth it. So I'm glad that you mentioned tide pools, Ryan, because I've got another animal here that I want to show us. And let me see if I can get it all ready for us to go. And this is an animal that you might find in a tide pool as well. So let's see here. Oh, I'm excited. They are some of my favorite environments to play in and go exploring because they're so accessible on the beach there. Lots of fun for sure. So I'm going to share my screen again. See that okay? Oh yeah, we're looking down into a tank at what looks like almost a squishy little thing on a rock. I know, right? That's a great description. What we're looking at right now, Ryan, is a sea anemone. Oh, very yeah. cool. So this is an animal that's alive. It's an invertebrate, right? And it's attached itself to this rock and it's waving all these little tentacles around. And it's basically just trying to pick up any food that might be free floating in the water. Here at the museum, we feed our anemones little tiny shrimp and sometimes a little pieces of squid. So what I want to do is I want to see if we can pop a little piece of squid on top of our anemone to see if it decides it might want to grab hold onto right now. So it has all those little tentacles. And if it decides that it is hungry, remember, our animals sometimes do get camera shy, it should pull it inside to the center of the mouth. See that very middle there? Well, let's see if uh, this anemone decides it wants a little piece of squid. Let's see how lucky we are today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop that there and just leave it hanging out for a little bit. And we'll Ooh, see- Ooh, I'm starting to see some movement already. Mm, it's deciding whether or not it is hungry, as you can see. Now, one of the things that's really, really incredible and interesting about all those little tentacles, Ryan, is that believe it or not, they actually have little stingers on them called nematocysts. So while we just pop a little piece of squid on top of our anemone, it's not unusual for anemones to sometimes even catch live prey. And those stinging tentacles will help immobilize or make sure the animal doesn't squirm around and get away. And then slowly but surely, it starts to bring in its tentacles and it takes a little while. So like I said, our anemone might not be in the mood right now, but it starts to bring it slowly, slowly, slowly into its mouth until it's completely engulfed. Very interesting. Tell you yeah, what, it looks why like it's hanging out there for a second. Why don't we leave our anemone alone for a moment and we can get back to it. We'll see just how it's doing, okay? Yeah, maybe we'll check back and see the progress in just a little bit. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Now, there is another animal that you might find in a tidal pool. One that we actually talked about last week. One that I thought was definitely really peculiar and really cool. All right, so it is the ever familiar sea star. Like I mentioned, we talked about this in our animal defense episode last, uh, last month, I should say. Yeah. And what you'll notice is all those little tube feet moving around. They just start feeling through the water. And those are really, really important when it comes to feeding because like our snail, this animal is also a predator. It is a hunter that eats other animals. One of the things it loves to eat, just like our snail, is clams. Ooh. But this animal 
eats in a really peculiar way. It doesn't have a radula, that special tool that we talked about before to help scrape a little hole inside or a proboscis, that long straw tube that can insert into the clam to feed. So what exactly does it do? Well, turns out that sea stars will actually envelop a clam, right? And they use all those little tube feet to start to pull and pull as strongly as they can, hoping to tire out that clam. So as we can see over here, it is completely shut, but you can imagine the sea star pulling and pulling and, and exerting all sorts of different force. Eventually that clam, which is really, really, really shut tight, gets super tired and it might crack itself just a little tiny bit, maybe even that much. You see that just a little tiny bit there? Well, that is just enough and exactly what that sea star has been waiting for because what it does next is really, really weird. We tend to think of eating our food and then digesting it in our stomachs, right? Inside our bodies, of course. But when it comes to sea stars, it's actually something totally different. Believe it or not, their stomach comes out the center. So let me see if I can get. Holy moly, like their whole stomach? A whole stomach looks like a translucent pink blob and comes out right around there. And it is super flexible. And it can insert that stomach in that tiny little crevice that it's managed to open up in that clam. And in that stomach, it has all sorts of different enzymes, digestive juices. And what they're doing is they're breaking down that clam and turning it into a clam chowder, a slurpable, liquefied version of itself that it can later use to just bring back inside its body and move on to the next clam. Could you imagine if you had to expel your whole stomach, still attached to your body, digest your food on the outside, and then bring it inside every time? Time you wanted something to eat that would be really weird i'll tell you what that would probably make dinner parties a much more interesting affair for humans than they are now oh absolutely so again definitely one of the weirdest eaters if you ask me and sea stars as you can see they're moving all their little two feet around so why don't we move on to another animal and this one is one that i really 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 love uh, I need to bring out my towel here because this is an animal that has a tendency to drip all over the place. Well, I'm super excited. Anytime you're going to have to get any extra materials or tools to get an animal out, I'm pretty pumped at what that creature might be. Right? All right. So I've got my towel set up, I think, right in the right spot. So I'm going to bring out an animal that we really love here at the museum and is really peculiar. So let's grab it out here. This is one of our horseshoe crabs. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Here we have it, as you can see. Oh, very neat. All right, you seem to be familiar, of course, with a horseshoe crab. You've got its long tail back over here. It's not a stinger, it can't hurt you. They basically just use this to right themselves if they ever find themselves over. And this is an animal that scurries around the ocean bottom. It might come up on the shore in low tide, just kind of moves around. And it is what we call a scavenger, right? So it's not exactly a predator like our dog whelk or our sea star. It's not actively trying to get into a lot of clams. It's trying to pick up any material, any food that it finds along the ocean bottom. But that's not too, too weird, right? What exactly is kind of bizarre about this? Well, we have to flip over our horseshoe crab to get a better look to really understand that. So. Here we have our horseshoe crab, as you can see, is quite spry moving around. I'm gonna flip him over. Oh, that's a great shot, because usually you're at the beach, you almost never get to see underneath the horseshoe crab because they're so well protected. Isn't that true? Well, you can see all those little legs there. You can see those two little pincers up front that have a special name. They're called salicera. Huh. Salicera. And here's what's really, really peculiar about our horseshoe crabs. So you see the little pincers right up there as it moves around the ocean bottom. Again, it's scurrying, scurrying about. It's looking for little pieces, maybe a little piece of squid like what we had earlier. And once it finds that, it consumes it in its mouth. 
but its mouth is not where you expect it to be. So if this is front here, you might expect the mouth to be right around up here, right? This yeah. Back end over there. But believe it or not, the mouth of our horseshoe crab is right dead center over here. You see oh, that? Oh, so weird. You see all those little bristles there? Yeah, it's kind of got like, I don't even know. Instead of teeth, it almost has yeah, tons of bristles. Right? So that is our horseshoe crab mouth. And thankfully, I've got a quick little video I want to share with you so we can get a better sense of what it looks like when they actually eat. So I'm going to share my screen here. So this is a horseshoe crab. It's moving along the bottom of the ocean. And it's found a good piece of food, right? And this is well, what it's going to do next. Yeah, in this instance, I've actually fed it a good piece of food. I've fed it a good uh -huh. little piece of squid here. But let's check it out in action. So we see the piece of squid right up front there. Mm -hmm. now let's find out what happens right when it eats. So let's hit play. Oh, so it's got the food in the mouth there now. And it's slowly bringing it in. Now we'll get a quicker, closer look. And all those little bristles kind of munching on that piece of squid. What I want you to notice is how that squid piece is disappearing, right? It's uh -huh. slowly, surely getting consumed by our horseshoe crab. Oh, man, look at that. And you can even see those little mandibles or pincers there trying to kind of maneuver it in early on there. Oh, yeah. Very so, neat. So there it goes, slowly but surely. Get a quick more shot until it disappears. <gasps> I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. Right, and it's gone and going and almost gone. So that is a horseshoe crab, one of the weirdest eaters in my opinion. Munching on a piece of squid. Now, one of the things that's super, super interesting, Ryan, is that you know a horseshoe crab is found in the ocean, and it is called a horseshoe crab. So you may think to yourself, well, it's got to be. A weird type of crab, right? But you would, got, be, uh, you know, you would think, right? It, it definitely has those little tiny pincers in there, which are similar to what a crab pincers might look like. But believe it or not, it's not a crab at all. It's a different kind of animal. And in fact, one of the closest relatives of a horseshoe crab is something somewhat rather unexpected. It's an animal that we saw last month, but we're going to bring so, it up again. I'm going to pause Javier for a quick second. And I'm going to warn those of you at home, there is an animal about to be shown that some people may not be that excited to see, but it is a very cool animal. And this is going to be our spider warning time. We are about to have a spider come on to the show at some point. For those of you who don't like spiders, you can take a moment. Or if you want to be especially brave and face your fears, now is that moment. All right. So let's... See if we can get our curly haired tarantula back on screen here. Give it just a moment. And there yeah. she is. Look at that girl. So, what is so weird about the way spiders eat? Well, I've always found and actually heard that spiders, what they'll do is they'll take their fangs, right? and inject them into their prey. So they are carnivores, they are hunters as well. And they will use those fangs to kind of drink the blood or, or slurp up the juices of the animals they're eating. And that's not exactly correct. It's not like the fangs themselves are straws, right? The fangs are just there to do something called envenomate, right? Once a tarantula bites you, it can inject venom into its prey. And the venom is really to paralyze, to, again, immobilize or keep the animals trying to eat still. So what exactly is the process by which the tarantula eats? Well, remember those little pincers that our horseshoe crab had? Oh, yeah. Well, it turns out that tarantulas have modified versions of those salicerae as well. Actually, the two little stinger parts of the tarantula that you see, let me see if I can switch up our live view here and see an exoskeleton just a moment. So let's see if we can get a better view. Oh, there you go, right in the good shot there. So you see those so parts of the fangs right there? 
Right over oh, there. Yes, yeah, right there where your finger is. So those are the fangs, right? They act kind of like a syringe injecting the venom. But the fangs are attached to those salicylate. And the salicylate have all those little tiny hairs. And the tarantula, once it has its prey in its mouth, it'll do a couple of things. It'll start to crunch up and munch up in its mouth at the same time, spitting out those digestive juices that we talked about. So much like in the way of the starfish, I'm sorry, the sea star, it will start to break down and really create a version of the animal that it can slurp back up. Its mouth is actually in between those salicylate. So it starts to make sure it's crumpling up and breaking down and slurping up all the bits that have now turned into a part that it can actually digest together. Isn't that crazy? So why don't we get a better view of our tarantula up close here. See if we can actually get a closer look. Come on, baby. And again, not everybody's super keen on seeing a tarantula up close, but I want you to be able to see those salicylates. So those two hairy looking things, the very front there. Oh yeah, those, yeah, I see it. Those are the salicylates. Oh. And what's interesting is it has all those hairs there that kind of act like a filter. So it makes sure that it doesn't get anything it doesn't want inside its mouth. Yeah, that and, would be pretty. Oh, go ahead. So another thing that's kind of interesting is this is pretty much similar of all arachnids with a couple of exceptions, right? So you can see the solicitor in there. And there's another arachnid here that I want to show you that eats in the same kind of way. So this is an animal we haven't seen yet. I'm gonna bring that one out in just a moment here. But you may already guess what this is. Let's see here. So while you're doing that, Javier, I just wanna give you a big props. And for those of you at home, Javier is not only doing the show right now with us, but he is wrangling all of the animals simultaneously that we are seeing live. So he's got a lot going on, but it looks like it's a pretty fun thing to do. So before we move on to our next animal really quickly, I just want to show us this little video here of our tarantula's fangs in action. So I'm looking at what looks like a burrow. Oh, there's our tarantula. What have you got there in the middle? So that is a mealworm. All right. Also want to point out, Ryan, is you see that bald spot in the abdomen there? Oh yeah. If you joined us last month, you might have remembered we talked about the releasing of the little tiny hairs. That was an instance where the tarantula did feel the need to release them. It's since shed uh, and now or molted, I should say, and now he's got them all back. Oh, nice. Yeah, so anyone that was with us last week, that was a really neat question that was answered. Oh, it's turning around. Ooh. All right, so I see, oh, and there those fangs are. And there it starts to squish up and munch up. Oh, yeah. Yogurt, spitting out those digestive juices and enzymes. Oof. All right. We talked okay. about another arachnid. And let's see if we can get this one up. And we'll just do a quick little show of this one because this is an animal that also eats the same way as our tarantula does. It has those same salicylate, but they're slightly a little different. Believe it or not, I'll show you a picture in just a moment here. The mouth parts of our scorpion look like little tiny pincers. And again, they're used to kind of scrunch up, squish up whatever it's eating as it expit, expels or spits out those digestive juices to help break down the animal so we can then slurp it back up. This Very is our Arizona good. hairy scorpion. Let me see if I can show us a quick little photo here of what those mouth parts look like. Oh yeah, nice close up there. So you'll notice right here, you see those little pincers? Uh-huh. One there, and there's another one in there. And those are similar to the ones we saw on our horseshoe crab earlier. Again, those are the salicylate. Very neat. All right. Never We've got seen a that close. I know. We've got one more animal. I know we're running short on time here, and I want to make sure we get to all of them. And this is probably my favorite animal, I would say. I've got a lot of favorites, so I, I say that very, very often. 
Is this gonna it's hard to choose just one favorite, isn't it, Javier? It's so difficult. It's it's close to impossible, actually. So let me get my my camera here ready. All righty. Do you see that? Okay. That's our massive frog friend. Oh yeah, great close up. Taking in his little breaths there, we can see both of those gorgeous eyes. He is a tank. So this is our African bullfrog. This is an animal that has some pretty unusual ways of eating. One of the things I think is really interesting is that, first of all, you don't think of frogs having teeth, but believe it or not, it has little, tiny teeth at the top of this jaw, and then two kind of smallish little fangs at the bottom, which it really just uses to hold on to its prey. This is a frog that has a really big mouth. And what I mean by that is that it basically fit a whole lot of different stuff in its mouth. So it is what we call an opportunist eater. It'll eat whatever opportunity presents itself. So that might be a mouse, a bug, a lizard, whatever it can really fit inside its mouth. But that's not really the weird part. The first thing that I think is kind of weird about a frog eating is that it doesn't have its tongue in the back of its throat, the back of its mouth like you and I do. Believe it or not, it's attached at the very front of its jaw. I'm going for a little walk there, bud. <laughs> and it uses that tongue, which is incredibly sticky, to unfold and pick up whatever it's trying to eat. May that be a cricket or a mealworm, whatever it really wants to munch on. And I think it's super, super cool is that it can kind of direct that tongue, right? So if it's got a mealworm here to the left, it might just unfold its tongue a little bit that way. If it's got one right in front of it, it might turn it out super far right in front and then fold it back in on the inside. Why don't we watch a quick little video of what that looks like here? And I think this one's going to be really, uh, really cool. So oh, yes, please. Here we go. So you see my mouse moving there, Ryan? Oh, yeah. I can see a couple of mealworms down there. I got your mouse moving. I want you to see the mealworm or focus on the mealworm down here by its leg, okay? All right. Here we go. Oh, you're right. It did just kind of dropped it right out of its mouth right there. Isn't that cool? That was so neat. Oh, and it's doing something really weird with it. Oh, yeah. What so, was it doing there with its eyes? Well, that's a great question. So we know that frogs, like I said, shoot out that tongue, right? And then uh -huh. bring it on the inside. But as I mentioned, the frog tongues are super, super sticky. So it actually needs a little bit of help swallowing, sometimes because the actual things get stuck to its tongue and it just needs special help to get it all the way down its throat. So believe it or not, what frogs do is they use their eyeballs, okay? Oh. Think about basically pushing them down into their skull and creating kind of pressure inside to help push whatever they're eating all the way down their throat. I want to get a better view of what that looks like just here in a moment. I want you to notice the closing of the eyes. There it goes. Oh, oh. man. Now watch those eyes. See those fangs down there? Go. And there you go. Pushes them right in there. Oof, I still can't get over how that tongue just kind of flaps out like that. That is so much fun to watch. One more time. Ready? Blah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. That's a cool tongue. <laughs> Let's go back to our frog one more time, because how could we not, right? You see him? He's kind of hanging out right there. Oh, yeah. It's kind of nice. You even got the uh, the old sea star back there is giving a little wave. Right? Oh, love him. And Ryan, that is pretty much all of our weird eaters for today. Wow, that was a ton of amazing animals. So thank you so much, Javier. Real quick, it looks like we're reaching the end of this portion of the presentation because we are out of animals today. But holy moly guacamole, there are a ton of amazing questions. And we're gonna delve into those in just a second. But before we do, I just wanted to thank all of y'all for joining us today and having fun while we got to know some amazing animals. If you enjoyed this event and are curious about more great online content, be sure to check out HMSC Connects, 
where you can listen to podcasts, do cool activities, coloring pages, get weekly e-newsletters, and even more great content, including, drum roll, a special HMSC members family event called Animal Problem Solvers on March 30th, hosted by our friend Javier here. So if you are already a member or are thinking of becoming one, check out this great event for the whole family. All right, now it's on to the questions. Are you ready for some cool questions, Javier? Let's do it. All right, so what I'm gonna do this time, I'm gonna scroll us all the way to the beginning and I'm gonna start asking us questions in order about some of the animals we saw today. And one of the questions that seemed to be reoccurring but started with the anemone is, where do we get some of our animals, Javier? Oh man, what a great question. Well, the marine animals that you saw came to us from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute down in Falmouth. So we have a special relationship with them. Our horseshoe crabs, for example, we swap out every six months. So it's just about getting that time where we'll bring them back to Woods Hole and they can get another ones. But we keep them here inside our large marine tank in our classroom. And as you can tell, they are fantastic colleagues and they've been helping teach us about the marine world for a long time. And they've got a buddy like you to come in every day and take care of them and keep them company. So that's not a bad uh, little bit too. So I'm gonna move on now to something that I thought of right off of the bat when we started talking about the animals we're gonna to discuss today. And the question is from Nick. And Nick is wondering, how does the snail kill or catch up to its prey because it's so slow? Such a great question. Oh my gosh. Well, as you saw, our dog whelk wasn't really doing much that time, right? It was just kind of sitting there inside of its shell, kind of like a turtle inside of its shell. Uh, and that species of snail goes after things that are relatively slow, right? This clam isn't really moving too, too fast. But you know what's kind of incredible is that there are some species of sea snails, say for example, cone snails, that actually do eat fast moving prey. But what they typically do is they wait for them to get close enough, right? Just close, close, close enough. And then they'll shoot a barb out, kind of like that tentacle with the um, anemones and they'll bring it back inside. So while our snail is specifically going after things that are slow moving so they can eat, there are snails out there that will eat things that are rather fast. Which is crazy because if you were to name ambush predators, I would never put on that list a snail as an ambush predator. Well, it's so Which weird. You also answered one of the questions I had coming for you. We had a couple of people that were curious. They could see the shell of the whelk, but they couldn't see the whelk itself. And I think you just mentioned it's like a turtle almost, but it was inside of its shell. So you could almost see that little flap trap dory kind of thing there where it would pop out. But let's see if Javier, we can get a good look at where the actual whelk would be inside the shell. We have our whelk here. And it's got oh, kind of okay. like hard little piece here called the upper column. I might be pronouncing that totally wrong. Uh, but it's basically a little trap door that um, uh, closes shut. And one of the things that I have typically found is that our whelk really likes to come out at night. It's not very often that I'm here late at night at the museum, but in the winter when it gets dark fairly early and it's really dark in the classroom, that's when I find our whelk is the most active. Very interesting. But great shot. Thank you so much for showing the whelk inside the shell there. So I have a question from a couple of people, but Tori is curious. Do we know how long it takes the whelk to drill the hole for eating? Great question. So I was curious about this myself. In my understanding that it can take a few hours, really. Oh, Remember, wow. it's not really like an electric drill. It's going to <laughs> just go in really, really quick. It's scraping away, kind of like a nail file. So it's going slowly, layer by layer, bit by bit, until eventually you get that hole we talked about before, right? Just kind of like that. So it's interesting. It's like the drill slowly erodes away as opposed to what we're used to, which is just boom, drilling right on in. Very cool. So I have an interesting question here from a couple of people. And 
we discussed this environment in which several of our animals will live, but there are a couple people who might not live close enough to the ocean and aren't aware of what these amazing tide pools that we briefly talked about were. Mm -hmm. So a tide pool is such an amazing environment. You're absolutely right, Ryan. You do kind of have to be close to the ocean to really experience it. But what happens is that there are certain places where at low tide, water might be trapped in an area, right? And those little pools are what we call tide pools. And those are miniature fascinating ecosystems where you might find things like whelks, sea stars, or anemones, and all sorts of other critters. So they're really, really incredible. If you ever do get the opportunity to go by an area where there's lots and lots of tide pools, I know there's some really great places in New Hampshire, for example, Definitely do check them out at low, at low tide. Yeah, and for anyone, I always thought, uh, I have a friend on the West Coast, and we live on the East Coast, so I always used to brag that we have the best tide pools. Then he sent me some pictures of some tide pools on the Pacific Northwest. They've got some pretty neat tide pools up there too. So all around the world, if you're anywhere there on the beach or anywhere where the ocean touches the land, there's a good chance you'll be able to see some neat creatures that kind of coexist both on land and in water, which is really fabulous. All right, I've got one about the anemone. So is it strong or is it squishy? That's such a great question. So the anemone is an invertebrate. Believe it or not, it's related to uh, jellyfish. It's an Indarian. Uh, and it's definitely on the squishier side. Let me do something kind of incredible. Remember what the uh, anemone looked like when it was in the water? It was mm -hmm. kind of like blossomed open like that. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna bring out the anemone out of the water so you see what it looks like. So this is kind of strange. Make sure I don't get any salt water or anything. But this is what the anemone looks like when it's out of the water. Kind of like a soft blob. Oh yeah. It's kind of it looks almost like what you'd see if a jellyfish ended up on the beach and not in water. It just kind of loses all shape of itself in a way. Absolutely. One of the things we didn't kind of talk about, Ryan, is that in a lot of ways, you know, we human beings are weird eaters. Everything that we've talked about today, everything, frogs, scorpions, tarantulas, anemones, whelks, maybe not sea stars, but almost everything is something that people around the world actually eat themselves. Mm -hmm. We are quite an opportunistic eater as a species. I'll say for, my, for me, I will probably try almost everything at least once. Mm. I worked in kitchens and I was trained as a cook for a long time in my life. So there's kind of a prerequisite or a requirement that you need to eat everything at least once if you're going to cook it. But I'll let those folks at home know, probably the most interesting and not as uh, terrible as I thought it was going to be was a scorpion. That one wasn't terrible. I tried scorpion before and it kind of tasted like a crunchy peanut, to be honest. There you go. So we will eat just about anything. All right, so I've got a ton more questions and let's fire away. This one, I'm just gonna leapfrog us, but I'm bum, right to our big African bullfrog at the very end. And someone is curious about how much food in a day does the African bullfrog eat or how much Usually on average, does it eat when you feed it? Oh, great question. So here at the museum, we feed our African bullfrog a variety of mealworms, superworms, and crickets. Uh, typically on a good day when our bullfrog is feeling definitely a little ravenous, it might eat between 20 to 30 crickets. We feed it every other day, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But what's super interesting about our frog is that they can actually go a pretty long time without eating as well. So it's not always something where it feels like it has to eat. But on a day when it's really, really hungry, that's a lot of crickets. Yeah, I can attest. We've both watched the African bullfrog just have at some crickets before. And it's usually a bit impressive at how many can actually get down and is sitting there. All right, I'm gonna rapid fire. There is uh, someone who has multiple questions about the horseshoe crab. Are you ready? I'm Go gonna throw it. it all into one question here. You ready? 
does the cra horseshoe crab have legs or does it swim? Does it have eyes and is it a fish? Oh my gosh, all amazing questions. Uh, it definitely has legs, right? So we saw all those little legs, the underside of the horseshoe crab, which it uses to scurry about. And while typically they will do scurrying, right? They'll do some crawling around the ocean bottom. They can swim a little bit. They have these things called book gills and they can actually flap them and they use them to swim if they really, really need to. But for the most part, they're, they're crawling around. And it does seem like, hey, there's a lot of things in the ocean that are fish, but horseshoe crabs are not one of those things. They are its own unique organism. And like I said, it's an organism that's been around for millions and millions and millions of years, almost entirely unchanged. We're talking about way longer than the dinosaurs even. Wow. And those were a long time ago. Holy moly. No, they're such an interesting animal. And it's one of those things that like, you know, again, you see, you go to the beach, you see it crawling around. It's just kind of, oh, it's a crab. And you're not like, oh, that thing has been around before dinosaurs existed. So it just kind of blows your mind sometimes. Totally. All right. Let's see. We've got some more fun questions here for you. I'm going to see if I can. Oh, I've got a fun one about the frog here. So where does the African bullfrog live? Great question. So if I'm not mistaken, I think it lives in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's found pretty much throughout that part of the continent. So it's not limited to one country in um, particular, but it's found in areas which can be somewhat a little bit dry, right? We tend to think of frogs as being really, 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 really tropical. And we'll touch on that a little bit in our next um, animal after school encounters but it lives in an environment where when it does get dry, it can burrow underground and remain there up to two years. Oh, wow. Because me, I think you think hibernating, you usually think bears, kind of things like that. You would, I wouldn't think a frog would hibernate just thinking about hibernating animals. Speaking of the frog, we did have a couple of people that were curious if, is our frog chubby or is that a good sized African bullfrog? That's a great question. I would say that our frog is pretty much on par with most African bullfrogs. So I wouldn't say it's a particularly chubby or overweight. It's just a normal size African bullfrog. Yeah, they're just kind of a stocky animal there. It kind of has that look to it. One of the largest frog species in the world, in fact. Yeah, no, they are big. Having to see you lift it with two hands, I can only imagine how big that frog is there. All right. Ooh, I had a quick question and someone was curious. We said we would uh, check back with the anemone. Do you know if it made any progress with that clam we put in earlier or it was full for the day and it's just kind of ready to eat for tomorrow maybe? So I am sad to report. I just checked on our anemone. It looks like it was not really in the mood to do some munching. It is kind of just let it sit by the side. So perhaps another time. Yeah. And that happens a lot with animals. We especially don't want to, you know, if something doesn't want to eat, we don't want to make it eat. So we let them do their thing. All right. We got a couple spider questions real quick, and then we're just about at the end of our program. But do you know, there's a lot of people that were really interested in how long a tarantula might be able to live either in the wild or in captivity. Interesting. Well, I don't have a, a definitive answer. Um, I know that ours has been um, us, ours has been here at the museum for a few years, maybe longer than you might think. But that's a good question. I'd have to be absolutely positive, I'd have to double check myself. But I would, say, you know, definitely the lifespan is longer than a few years than you would imagine. Gotcha. All right. So we're just about out of questions, but I have one question for you, Javier, that has been an overwhelming question. And I think I know the answer to it, but everyone was really concerned about the sea star's stomach inside the clam. What if the clam decided to just bite down really hard? That's a great question. And honestly, that's where those two feet come in, right? Think of it as a tug of war. The clam is trying to stay shut really, really tight, but that sea star is pulling and pulling and pulling apart. And eventually something's got to give. So sometimes more often than not, the clam gets tired and it just doesn't have the strength. So while it's still closing shut, it's opened up just enough, long enough 
for the sea, um, the sea star to do its digestion. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Javier, for all the amazing questions. And thank you so much to everybody that joined us today. I hope you had a great time with Weird Eaters Edition. Javier, do you have anything to say to the folks before we take off? I just hope you join us next time. And thanks for being here today. Fantastic. Thank you so much for attending this edition of After School Animal Encounters. And be sure to keep your eyes open for more to come. Have a great day, everybody.